Okay, uh, so the topic I'm going to talk about is obviously free and open source software at Flipkart, right? Uh, when you have a technology-driven company like Flipkart, you would obviously depend on a lot of free and open source softwares. So I'm going to give you a case study about uh, one of the softwares that we use, free and open source softwares that we use with, within Flipkart, on how the choice of FOSS helped us in the scaling to Flipkart scale that we are doing, right? Yeah, so this is the agenda. Okay, uh, who we are, uh, Flipkart, I'm sure maybe 100% of you have used Flipkart. Uh, it's a uh, e-commerce company, uh, one of the leading ones in India. And when you talk about e-commerce, um, it is, uh, it has diverse set of domains, right? For example, if you think of maybe search, it you have to go in quite deep in search itself as a domain. And then when you're talking about transactional path, where you make the order, placing order payments and so on, that itself is a deep enough domain. And then there is seller aspect to it, there is uh, warehouse management, and there is uh, fulfillment aspects. And you have a lot of different domains which are, what, which you can go in pretty deep and when you want to get to a scale of Flipkart, you obviously have to do quite a uh, quite a, a good amount of work in each of these aspects, right? So with the having so many domains, obviously the complexity that comes in and having the scale that, that Flipkart does, you get a lot of uh, these things that are expected from you, right? So if you look at a typical e-commerce, I don't know, probably like uh, everyone agrees here and this is how I look at it, right? On the uh, left side, left column, you can see that there are users, um, customers, uh, sellers, um, agents, delivery agents, and customer care agents, and so on and so forth. So you have different sort of users. For each set of users, you would want to give certain, you would want to have certain applications which, uh, what do you call, uh, which you want to address their problems or you want to give the experience to them and so on and so forth. So you have in the second column that you have a lot of applications, some of them catering to some of the users. And then the next, column that you see is where the platform lies, where you would want your applications to use them instead of building for each application. For example, if you want to use a database, right? You don't want each application to make a decision on which database that you want to use. Or you want to uh, may, maybe a package management. You don't want each application. So you want some central, central platforms which are to be available for each of these applications to use. And I've put down some examples of it. Obviously, this is not a complete list, and you have a lot more of them, right? And uh, that is what who we are, an e-commerce company, and why do we need FOSS, right? When you are talking about FOSS, uh, you have, uh, what, certain reasons why you choose uh, open source software, right? So one of, I put down some list here, obviously, like, you have a lot more than than these. These are probably very strong points. One of them being a very, uh, what do you call, a very strong community that you get out of uh, open source software, which otherwise you would probably be, be like wanting to have one community to which you can maybe talk to or probably like spend some time and then maybe contribute to improve your own uh, capabilities and so on and so forth. That is one of the big plus and then the second thing is, uh, you look at any successful product, successful open source projects, right? One thing that strikes out very well is you have a very strong process in place, right? Uh, I'm sure like 100% of the people agree here that you go build something within your company, you will definitely be not able to reach to the scale of uh, open source software in terms of processes that they follow, right? For example, unit test cases, right? Uh, or or uh, anyone that you want to contribute from outside, right? You have a process for that. And uh, each component would have their own owners who would review it, who are the domain experts in that com uh, component. So you have these processes which makes the open source tick, right? And then uh, the next thing is um, you when you are picking some software, open source or not, 
first thing that you get you look for it is validation whether this software is good whether i can use this software or not whether this is trustworthy or not right and open source makes it very easy for example you look at maybe github stars right being one of the validation point for you to uh, maybe like give that validation that is yes, this is a good software or probably you look at the committers and where they work for what who, which company they work for and what do they do and so on and or maybe like you look at what are the discussions that have happening in the uh, probably like f forums or probably you look at the commits how frequently they are making releases so many things so you have so many data points for you to build that trust on a software and that's another reason where open source stick right and then another thing is you will be able to customize say for example you you chose to select a software open source software 99.9% .9 of the things are what you what you need but maybe that 0.01% is not something that you would want it to be and you would definitely like or probably that's a bare minimal requirement for you to so you go pick it up and then you customize it you ensure that there is a process for you to apply as and when new patches come and so on and so forth but that is another very very strong point for you to consider open source right and quality of open source good open source projects i don't need to comment on it you look at linux right so linux kernel is there in your handheld devices on pretty much any device for any form factor that you can think of everywhere it is there such a complex piece of software can you think of any company building it even though they have unlimited resources like google and so on and so forth they have used linux right so that speaks a lot about what open source is the kind of uh, what you call the quality that open source software gives the kind of flexibility gives and so on and so forth so this is these are some of the reasons why probably any company i am not talking about flipkart any any technology company uses or probably like any any even academia or anywhere else you see open source sticks right and here i have put down some of the i come from platform teams uh, i work in hbs team uh, so that's why i put some of the uh, platform team using open source softwares you see a lot of those open tsdb prometheus mysql kafka hbase obviously tidb or there's so many right um, so at uh, so i told you i work in hbase team so these are some of the numbers uh, that we do uh, so uh, we primarily so obviously with complex set of requirements within a company like flipkart you would cannot have a single choice saying okay maybe like some decades or probably even 15 15 years ago mysql was used very popular right now you have lot of fine grain requirements saying this sort of use case i'll go with this particular sort of a database right these are my requirements and so on right and for H even within flipkart as well we have many databases hbase being one of them primarily catered towards uh, oltp uh, based uh, uh, functional uh, use cases right and then this bbd we did in hbase around 5 million qps with some infra that we have put and we run completely on kubernetes right right so when uh, you pick a software right when you pick a open source software or probably like any other software that you want to choose for example like in in flipkart there is a requirement that you want to choose a database some seniors got together and maybe they went for enterprise software or open source software they would think in these directions right first thing is you would want uh, maybe check box a functional need what does your application needs right what 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 sort of requirements does your application have for example uh maybe uh, in this case um, i would want a consistent store consistency over availability in cap theorem right so consistent store my preference is con consistency over availability and maybe second requirement is um, i would want a primary key based lookups for example uh, order management system uh, always the request comes with an order id you go look up from the order and then you get all the information and then do and then update it and do what not right uh, and then uh, many times uh, when the choice is being made uh, you would want to look at the architectural trade offs that uh, the open source software has been uh, uh, has made at the time of their uh, uh, coming to inception to uh, in, at the time of inception right so for example in hbase 
uh, if you think, uh, if you know, uh, there is a concept or data structure called LSM, where which is pretty good for high write throughput, right? Uh, when you look at some of the drawbacks of MySQL, where you are not able to scale well and so on, uh, you would have some some class of databases which are based on LSM, where you don't write in the write path, you just uh, write it to an up and only file system and then you move ahead, right? Uh, so some architectural decisions that, like these have been made when a certain software is being built. That is some of the things that you would want to understand before you make a choice, right? A lot of these things are taken for granted when you're talking about open source software because everything is out in the open. Like you go look at the design choices that they have made, you go look at the source code that they have written, everything is available, right? And another class of requirement that uh, when a decision is being made is non-functional aspects, whether it is maintainable, whether it is scalable, whether it is uh, uh, fault tolerant, and so on and so forth. So you have these two as primary set of requirements. One other very important aspect is whether this software is open source or not. For a lot of the reasons that I mentioned in the previous slide, obviously that is going to, uh, that I would recommend everyone, I'm sure everyone are already doing, everyone to think about. If this is open source, then obviously it checks some of the boxes that you have, and then your other requirements are also fit in, then obviously go ahead, right? So uh, I'm talking. I'm going to talk about a bit on HBase, specifically at Flipkart, uh, that the team that I'm working on, working in. Um, here, when the choice has been made that we are going to go with HBase, it is not that. Again, I'm not going to go into too deep uh, on these aspects because that is not the goal of this talk. Um, and I have some references, blogs that we have written. You can go over it if you are interested in very deep. Um, so when the decision has been made that HBase is checking, checking all our uh, checkboxes that we want uh, a database to have, it is not that not necessary that 100% of uh, the requirements are going to be met, right? So some of the shortcomings were, so in HBase there are uh, primarily two layers. One layer is the serve layer, that is the HBase. And then there is data layer, that is HDFS. Right? Uh, on the serve layer, HBase gives a multi-tenancy. So why multi-tenancy is important for us is we have uh, uh, around, uh, right now, maybe around 170, 180 use cases. Right? If you want to run 180 different HBase clusters, HBase, if some of you have used, it's pretty uh, complex to maintain. Right? It has a lot of components. It requires a lot of hardware to bring up a single cluster, and it has a lot of maintenance overhead. So if you have to bring up 180 different clusters versus you bring up one cluster, and you have specifically what the nodes that are required or pods that are required for a specific tenant, it makes a huge difference, right? Uh, forget about the money aspect. For developers to maintain itself, it, it's going to give you so much uh, freedom. Uh, that is uh, that is one of the shortcomings that were there uh, when we chose um, HBase. And uh, because it is open source, because we know that we can read through the source, because we can look through and understand what is there, and you can modify it, and so on and so forth. We chose to go ahead and we modified it. We modified, customized it to our needs, ensuring that the core parts of it are not touched. We are able to progress it. For example, earlier we used to use HBase 1.x, later we moved to 2.1x, now we are 2.5x. Right? So we are able to move forward. We are not stuck with this that we have modified and we have diverged so much that we are not able to go ahead. Right? So we have modified certain bits, but which is not touching the core bits, and you are able to take these patches and apply it to the new versions without, and you are able to test it, verify it, and then, uh, uh, and then take it forward. Right? So uh, in, with respect to data, uh, there are again two layers there, right? So I'm not going to explain the details of what is there in the diagram. I, 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 the slides will be available for you to go through. I'll just explain conceptually how it looks, right? So when you have 
two layers like HBase and HDFS. HBase as uh, a process called region server, and HDFS there's process called there are process called uh, data nodes. HBase side you have perfectly isolated per uh, tenant. Uh, you have a concept called region server groups where you can group them together and then give. Uh, to a specific tenant, okay, these are the set of nodes where you have, say, X cores and Y memory and so on and so forth. You can run it as per your scale requirements. But underlying data nodes are not isolated or not doesn't have multi-tenancy. Why that will be a problem is, say, if you look at two requirements, right? So requirement one is that uh, I have a million QPS. Uh, in that million QPS, I have a data size of one terabytes, not more than that and I want a uh, tail latencies of maybe like 50 millisecond. That's a requirement number one. Requirement number two, I am in a secondary path. I am having huge amounts of data, maybe like 100 terabytes or 200 terabytes. My QPS is 20 or 30. I have requirements of like tail latencies, maybe 100, 200,000, doesn't matter, right? So these are two different requirements. So you would want to provision different kinds of hardware, including the storage layer, right? The storage layer probably will, will put a uh, NVMe uh, sort of a storage for first, first category, and then probably will put a very ordinary um, HDD spinning disk sort of for second category. And both of them work fine, but when this, isolation is not there in data, a data layer, then that means that all of them are homogeneous and you're not going to have uh, the requirements, able to meet the requirements for both sort of use cases, right? So then we uh, modified it to bring that sort of isolation on the data layer as well, right? And then the, the next bit was, there's a concept called write ahead log, if you have used MySQL bin log, right? Where in HBase, any write comes in, it writes to write ahead log and it writes to memory and then it says that write is done, right? If a node goes down, which whatever is there in memory, which is not to flush to disk, that data is gone. Then you will take this write ahead log and you can recover it. That's the purpose of write ahead log. So the second bit that we isolated was the write ahead log where a particular tenant's data, wall data is written to that tenant nodes only and then, uh, the other tenant nodes will get the wall data of the other. These are with respect to data isolation. And then there are a lot of uh, uh, supporting sort of uh, uh, tools or probably like processes or uh, aspects where you need isolation as well. For example, balancer. Balancer is one aspect. Um, say uh, in HBase, you can, it's pretty dynamic. You add a node it'll automatically balance it and make all of them, say you have 100 shards, you have nine nodes, you add one node, it'll become 10 nodes, and then it'll spread 10 shards per node and it'll balance it automatically, right? You take down two nodes, two nodes went down, and then it balances within the eight node. So it's pretty dynamic, right? And even HBase balancer doesn't understand the isolation aspects of the data layer, and even there we made a lot of changes. And some of these things HBase is built pretty well, uh, you are able to plug in, uh, for example, in case of a balancer, uh, there are concepts called functions, cost functions and um, uh, generators and so on, where you'll be able to add your own cost function, your own generator, to be able to pick and choose how do you balance it, right? So these are some of the things that we use to ensure that the isolation is there, still you are not diverging too much from the existing sort of a source code, right? And so, um, as I told, I'm not going to go into each of these details. You can read through the references that I've put here. What I'm trying to say is that you have so many reasons to use free and open source software, apart from the money alone. You should consider some of these things as well. For example, customization as one of the criteria that today your requirements might be satisfied, but tomorrow, you might reach some bottleneck. You cannot, it's not just easy to just, okay, I'll use this software instead of that one. It's not gonna be, you have integrated with it. Obviously you have to keep it loosely integrated, but that doesn't mean that you should not think ahead of time and make a choice today that, okay, I'm going to go with this sort of uh, thought process. Uh, okay, if I, things change like this, then, okay, this is open source. I'll be able to customize it as per my needs and so on and so forth. 
and that's how I would go ahead with it, right? And as I told, companies like Flipkart have invested a lot in open source softwares. We use it every day, and a lot of commits go out from Flipkart as well. And then uh, the company itself promotes it in terms of open source contributions and open source uh, adoptions and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's it. If you have any questions, I'll take. Thank you, Malakarjun, for sharing how Flipkart uses free and open source software and how you guys contribute back to free and open source software.